Jimmy Moore runs one of the most successful podcasts globally. In the process of those podcasts, he's spoken to at least 30 of the world leaders in the low carbohydrate movement. And as a result of that, he's published two books. The first is Cholesterol Clarity, in which he reports his discussions with many of these world authorities. He discusses the information we need to know about cholesterol, its measurement, and what we need to do about abnormal measurements. His second book is Keto Clarity, and this describes in great detail the benefits of the low carbohydrate diet. Hey guys. Oh, come on. So I haven't used this clicker this week. I've seen all these people struggle with this clicker and Mike Eads cuss it out, so I'm gonna try to figure it out. You're supposed to laugh at that joke. So I've written a couple of books in the past two years, uh, Cholesterol Clarity and Keto Clarity, so uh, this is a really quick talk trying to pack in two years worth of books that I've written uh, into one. So uh, Cholesterol Clarity, What the H Dale is Wrong with My Numbers, wrote that in 2013, uh, collaborated, yeah, you can laugh at that too, that was funny. Um, Dr. Eric Westman is my co-author, and the other day, how many of you were in here the other day when I was telling my personal story, the medical professionals that were here? So I kind of started the story about cholesterol after I shared my weight loss story and, and went to see my doctor, right? So I said, and he said, how'd you lose all the weight? And I said, the um, Atkins diet. And he said, oh, we gotta check your cholesterol. Yeah, sure, go ahead. I'm, I'm healthier by all measures. So they run the cholesterol and my uh, HDL comes back at 72 in American terms. Don't ask me to translate. Um, but 72 is really good. And I said, isn't that amazing? He said, oh wow, that's really good. But you need to be on a statin drug. I said, all right, let's look at the triglycerides. 43, and I think that translates to something like 0.5 in your terms incredibly good. I said, have you ever seen it that low? Oh, that's the lowest I've ever seen in any patient I've ever had. But you need to be on a statin drug. <laughs> and, you know, if I, if I was a cussing man, I'd put the WTF in here. So I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. All, I figured out what he was doing. All he was predicating my state of cardiovascular risk was on total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. And I was like, there's got to be more to this story than this. So really, this has been almost a decade-long journey of me trying to figure out what the HDL is wrong with my numbers, that my doctor thinks that I have a problem that needs fixed with a drug that I had, by the way, been on before I started low carb. I was on both Lipitor and Crestor. It was interesting. I took Lipitor, was playing pickup game of basketball at my church, and I went up for the rebound, and this thumb just went straight backwards. And I went, ugh. So I go to the ER and the ER doc very astutely said, you must be taking a cholesterol lowering medication. I'm going, how in the world would you know that? He said, we're seeing more and more injuries happen as a result of people being on these drugs. So that kind of really opened my eyes. I go see my doctor. I said, I want to get off this Lipitor. It's a horrible, horrible drug. I need something better if cholesterol lowering is important. He said, okay, no problem. I got a much better one. He gave me Crestor. It's the same damn drug. <laughs> so I just wanted to learn more. So over the past decade, as uh, Jay told you, I've been able to interview over 900 of the world's best experts. So when it came time that a book publisher wanted to give me a, a, a book deal to write books, I said, well, I know all the people to contact. I've got 29 experts plus Dr. Westman to collaborate with me. But I wanted to look at how we got it all wrong, the things that we've gotten wrong about cholesterol, and we've gotten a lot of them wrong. You know, we think sky-high cholesterol actually means something. How many people in the room think a high total cholesterol means something in your health? Raise your hand. Be honest. I did. I used to believe that because every medical doctor told me uh, that my high cholesterol was giving me heart disease. So the first thing we got wrong about cholesterol is we think LDLC and total cholesterol are what matter the most. And what we've been told uh, in American terms is lower than 200 and in your terms under five is generally healthy. So are we suddenly uh, heart protective because we're under that magical number? 
and then suddenly at great heart health risk once we go over that threshold. It's really interesting too because the total cholesterol includes a number that you want to have higher, your HDL. And so the other thing is the LDLC. Somebody the other day mentioned the Friedwald equation. The LDLC is only a calculated number. How many people knew that your LDL was not directly measured? Most patients don't know that information. They think everything is measured directly, and yet they're predicating a lot of the treatment on that LDL, which is simply incorrect, especially when your triglycerides are under 100 and your HDL is over 50. So you really have to look at the numbers in a different way. And yet all they're obsessed about is LDLC and total cholesterol. So that leads us to number two. They all but ignore, like my doctor did, the HDL and the triglycerides. And yet those two things are important. And you've heard his name quite a bit today, but Dr. Jeff Folick has done some really incredible studies looking at the triglyceride to HDL ratio being a much better indicator. How many have had their doctor tell them anything about triglyceride to HDL ratio? Raise your hand. Oh wow, a lot more than I thought. But usually nobody even knows what a triglyceride is and yet doctors just ignore it. That's why they don't know what it is. Number three, we fail to uh, understand the varying LDL subparticles. So whenever somebody talks about, well, my LDL is X, well, they're referring to the LDLC number, but there is a, technologies out today. I'm not sure what it is here in South Africa. If you can get the particle size test, can you no. Know. So in America, it's very ubiquitous. Uh, various companies do it. Uh, there's the VAP test. There's HDL labs. There's one actually close to Dr. Westman's um, clinic, it's called um, the LipoScience is the name of the company and the name of the test is called an NMR lipo profile. And what it does is just shows the total number of LDL particles and then the breakdown of the size of those particles and the size matters. And yet doctors aren't talking about LDL particle size, they just look at LDL as one grand number, but it's actually a multiplicity of numbers as you can see from these varying sizes of the LDL. You have mostly large fluffy kind and you have small dense kind. It's the small dense kind you don't want. Want to guess how you get small dense LDL particles? You eat carbohydrates and you eat vegetable oils. Surefire way to make uh, small LDL particles. Number four. We assume that a 2.5 LDLC or a 5.0 total cholesterol needs a statin. How many in the room have taken a statin drug at some point in your life? Raise your hand. Look around, guys. That's scary. They have so made us fearful that we're going to die of a heart attack tomorrow if we have a cholesterol, an LDL cholesterol over 2.5 or a total cholesterol over 5.0, and it's completely ludicrous. I'm not saying that satin medications don't serve a purpose in someone who's already had a cardiovascular event, but in generally healthy people, I don't see the reason why you would ever need to take a statin drug if you're healthy. And what's really sad in America, they're wanting to put the statin dr drugs in the water supply. That is no lie. So it, it's really scary how they have made this kind of the default. And then guess what? The statin doesn't prevent a heart attack. If you prevent a heart attack from a statin drug, it's probably the, the inflammation lowering that happens, but it's more probably your mental placebo effect of you think it's doing something for you that's actually providing the benefit. And oh yeah, by the way, you're gonna get joint pain, muscle ache, all of these really bad things, and it messes with your head. Uh, you know, one of the things that really makes me mad about statins is they put them on generally older people. So once you get 60s, 70s, 80s, you tend to have a higher cholesterol naturally, and that's normal to have a higher level of cholesterol. And yet the doctor will see that, and they'll say, oh, well you have high cholesterol, you need to put you on a statin. So it lowers the cholesterol, but then that patient starts getting dementia. That person develops diabetes, which the, the statins have been shown to do. That person gets cancer. That person has Alzheimer's disease, and we're like, ah, it's just uh, diseases of old age. No, it wasn't. It was brought on possibly by this drug. Bad news. Number five thing we got wrong about cholesterol, we think low fat, low cholesterol is heart healthy. 
You know, and any kind, any time that we have gone on a diet, traditionally people, it's always defaulted to that. Why did we do that? Because the government told us it was healthy, because our doctors said it was healthy, dietitians say it was healthy. Right. I mean, we never investigated that, and we have Zoe Harcum to thank for really kind of exposing that whole myth that the low-fat diet is based on any kind of science. It's based on a whole lot of nothing. And so, and thankfully, just this last week in America, they have come out, the USDA Dietary Guidelines Committee, and in their notes from December, they said, you know, um, dietary cholesterol is not as bad as we said it was, so mm, you can go ahead and have a little bit. They, they recommend now one egg a day. So I'm thinking if there's nothing wrong with dietary cholesterol, why are we limiting it? So they're still under the fat phobia, but low fat was not the answer. Number six, and this is a big one. In cholesterol clarity, uh, Dr. Westman and I talked about twin villains in your health. The twin villains are carbohydrates and vegetable oils. So, and what's interesting about these uh, vegetable oils, on the Mazzola, you'll see it has like the American Heart Association uh, heart health symbol. I know in Australia they have the little tick program. Those are the clear signs that you need to avoid those foods. Anytime you see that. And so they put that heart healthy thing on there on the vegetable oils, mostly because vegetable oils do one thing very well on your cholesterol panel. Anybody know? It lowers LDL. But you know what it does? It lowers the good LDL, those large fluffy kind that we were talking about. It lowers those. And then, oh yeah, it gives you a little bonus the small dense LDL particles that are left, it oxidizes those, which makes them even more atherogenic. Those are actually causing more heart uh, harm than heart health, and yet they're promoted as healthy. And then I don't need to tell you about carbohydrates, especially the refined ones. We've heard all about that all weekend. Number seven, believing that low cholesterol levels are the optimal state. You know, there. Uh, there was a, a guy in America, Jay Leno, had the Tonight Show, and he would go out on the street and, and ask people on the street, you know, different questions, and if he went on the street and said, hey, uh, what's the perfect level of cholesterol? Do you know there would be some people that would say zero? Seriously. And that sounds funny, especially if you're a medical professional and you know what cholesterol does, but most people have been so scared to death that they have cholesterol in their body that they think zero is an optimal level. But low cholesterol, I argue, is even far worse than high cholesterol will ever be. Low cholesterol, once you get below the, and I'm gonna switch back to American terms, 130 level, once you get below that, and especially under 100, it can be very problematic. And I'll give you a, a prime example. There was a journalist in America named Tim Russert. He hosted a show called Meet the Press, Back in 2008, I believe it was, he died of the very first heart attack that he ever had. And he had uh, been following a low-fat diet, been exercising on a bike, and uh, taking a statin drug, and doing all the right things, and yet he still died of a heart attack. And so they did a cholesterol test on him uh, in the autopsy, and guess what his total cholesterol was when he died. Anybody know? It was 105. Obscenely low. I'm trying to translate that for you. Like about two? That's low. Really, really low. And so if low cholesterol is supposed to be so heart healthy, what the heck happened to Tim Russert? Well, I'll tell you what happened to Tim Russert. He had a heart scan that was off the charts. So you, there's this CT scan you can have of your chest that sees how much atherogenic plaque is in there, um, calcified plaque. And so he was like clogged to the, to the T despite eating low fat, despite eating healthy whole grains, despite riding on a bicycle, despite taking a statin drug and having the most incredible, perfect 105 total cholesterol, he still died of the very first heart attack. He had a lot of inflammation going on. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. Number eight. We assume that 
Someone who has high cholesterol, it's just genetic. I have always had high cholesterol. That was one of the things that got me interested in this subject was I wanted to learn why am I having high cholesterol? And so I thought I had the genes that said you have high cholesterol genetically. So for in anticipation of writing cholesterol clarity, I had the uh, cholesterol checked for FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, and it came back that I had a 5% chance likelihood. So in other words, not very likely that I had FH, and yet my total cholesterol was in the OMG levels that a doctor would go, you need a statin. And so it's not always genetic. What's sad though is whenever you get your, I don't know how it is here in South Africa, but in America, you'll get your results back and it'll say, you know, I have like a H next to some level and, or have a L for low. And, but then it'll have this nice little commentary that says, patient exhibits signs of possible familial hypercholesterol. I'm like, no, I've had it tested. And yet that scares people. Um, so don't always assume that high cholesterol is necessarily a genetic predisposition. Number nine, I'm gonna pick on you doctors a little bit. You have no clue why, high cholesterol, why people have high cholesterol. And it's true. We talked about this the other day. For you lay people that are in here, uh, it was mostly medical people when I spoke the other day and said, how much uh, nutritional information did you have? And I think the average was something like two weeks it was really low. Not surprising, um, you know, pe people will go, well, why am I asking my doctor for diet advice and how to fix cholesterol and fix whatever? And yet they have no clue. And there's a lot of reasons why cholesterol can go up that is totally separate from your diet that a low fat diet isn't gonna fix. I'll just give you one example we put in Cholesterol Clarity, um, an infection in the mouth. Did you know that if you had te tooth infections, like you maybe had a root canal that started getting infected, that will raise your cholesterol. The reason it raises your cholesterol is you have inflammation in there and the cholesterol goes to the source of the inflammation to put out the fire. And so I actually had four root canals in my early 20s because I chewed on hard candy as a kid and left it in there and you know. Anyway, so as an adult, I'm having to suffer the consequences from that. And I noticed that my cholesterol was getting higher and higher and higher. And it wasn't until I went to Australia and spoke to a holistic dentist. He was one of my experts in cholesterol clarity, uh, Ron Ehrlich. He said that if you have those deep-seated infections, that will raise your cholesterol. And yet how many doctors, when they see a high cholesterol level, are saying, you need to go see a dentist? It's not happening. And yet they want to put people on the statin. Does that fix the infection? No. So I actually got the infections fixed. I had also, also some mercury amalgams taken out and put in with some, I went to a holistic dentist and got all of that taken care of. It was very expensive, but one year later after doing that, my total cholesterol dropped over 100 points. Accident? I think not. Number 10. Totally missing the role and causes of inflammation. Anybody in here know what inflammation is? Raise your hand. Oh, you think you know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> inflammation really is at the heart of all disease. If you have low inflammation levels, which on a blood test you can have run, there's a, there's a key, there's a lot of inflammation markers, but the key one that most doctors zero in on is the HSCRP, the high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Anybody ever had that run? Yeah, so it kind of shows you your level of, of inflammation. And so ideally you want that under 1.0, definitely under 3.0. If you start going over 3.0, you're showing signs that you need to get that inflammation under control. So I, uh, oh, by the way, my current CRP is 0.44, which is extremely good. And so inflammation really is at the heart, all pun intended, of all your health. And so keeping inflammation low is key and yet Doctors don't talk about inflammation. They want to talk about cholesterol. I think we need to shift the conversation from treating cholesterol to treating inflammation. And how do you treat inflammation? I just told you a while ago, the things that raise inflammation are carbohydrates and vegetable oils. So what should we do to lower inflammation? Oh yeah, cut those things, right? Number 11, totally dismissing the role of blood sugar and insulin. 
And this is another one. You know, people are like, well, we're talking about cholesterol. What are you bringing in blood sugar and insulin for? They matter. They matter a lot. And yet most people, unless you're diabetic, you probably have not tested your blood sugar. Well, you guys probably have because you're probably more astute than the average person. But blood sugar matters. You need to know what your blood sugar is. And that's a whole lot more important than whatever your total cholesterol is, as well as your fasting insulin levels. And then the last one, demonizing cholesterol and not saying why it's good. Do you think if you talk to the average person on the street and you ask them, is cholesterol good or bad? Just ask it that way. What would they say? They would say it's bad. And they would say it's bad because we've been brainwashed. We've been propagandized to think that it's a bad thing. And yet I'm here to stand up for cholesterol and say that it is a very good thing. You have cholesterol, you have firefighters in your body to put out the fire, and guess what the fire is? Inflammation. So you want more firefighters, and if you have less firefighters to put out the fire, guess what happens to fires when there's no firefighter? It burns up, it destroys, and that's not what you want to have happen to your body. So that's cholesterol clarity. We're going to shift very quickly now to my next uh, topic, the 12 things we've gotten all wrong about ketosis, and we've talked a lot about uh, ketogenic diets here uh, pretty much all weekend, but I want to give you the layman's kind of terms perspective because you've heard a lot of sciencey stuff. I don't talk in that language. I'm very consumer friendly, so hopefully you like that. I wrote a book last year, Keto Clarity. What's, what's interesting was uh, when my publisher came to me and they said, hey, we want you, want you to write some books. We're trying to you know, get in the low carb world and everything. And I said, sure, I wanna write about ketogenic diets. That was the first thing out of my mouth. And they said, eh, no. I was like, why? They said, oh, it's too niche of a, of a subject. Nobody will really be interested in ketogenic diets. That's low carb diet. No, that's already been done. I said, no, it hadn't, not in this way. And, but they didn't believe me. So I, I said, okay, so what do you want me to write about? Because I'd given them a few topics. They said, this cholesterol one looks good. So I wrote cholesterol clarity first. And in hindsight, I'm glad I did because when you start talking about a high fat diet, what's the first objection people throw up at you? That it's gonna clog your arteries, raise your cholesterol and give you heart disease, right? So I said, okay, I'm glad we did that one first, but can I please write keto clarity? And they say, okay, we don't think it's gonna do as well, blah, blah, blah. Do you know when Keto Clarity came out, it sold more in the first week than Cholesterol Clarity did the first year? So then I got to go, na 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 na, I told you. And they're actually, they've actually given me another contract for a ketogenic cookbook, which will be coming out later this year. Um, I'm collaborating with uh, Dr. Westman, as he admitted earlier, is a horrible cook. So um, I had to go to another co-author on that one. And uh, sorry, wherever he is. And Maria Emmerich. Anybody know Maria's work? A few of you. So she and I are, are collaborating on a cookbook coming out in July. But let's look at the things we've gotten all wrong about ketosis. The first thing that we've gotten all wrong is we think ketosis is an unhealthy, dangerous state. And uh, Professor, uh, Professor, Dr. Finney actually just uh, told you about this one, but I'm gonna kind of elaborate it in a little more layman's terms for you. So diabetes, this is the scale of diabetes. 90% of diabetics are type two, and about 10% of the diabetes population is type one. All right, so let's imagine, oh, I meant to ask, how many type ones are in the audience? Raise your hand. So a few of you. So you type ones. Imagine you had a meal like that and that. So what would you normally do if you had a meal like that, if you're type one? You'd have to take insulin, right? You would have to, because they don't have any beta cell function. There's no way for their bodies to make insulin. So they have to take insulin, but this time, eh, we're not gonna do that. What's gonna happen? There's a trifecta of things that would happen. First, hyperglycemia would kick in at 13 plus on the blood sugar. Then you'd have blood ketone levels approaching 20 plus. When those two things are happening at the same time, when you have high blood sugar and simultaneously high blood ketones, you have very high acidosis happens. And very quickly you go into a coma 
and quite possibly death if you do not get electrolytes and insulin as soon as possible. But this cannot possibly happen in anyone who still makes even a little bit of insulin. And even if you're type one diabetic who makes no insulin, keto acidosis does not happen eating a low carb diet, only a high carb diet. So let's look at a typical ketogenic meal. I'm gonna let you like uh, salivate over that for a second. Oh, okay. So what are the things that happen when you eat a meal like that? You have blood sugar that's steady around four and a half to five. You have blood ketone levels that generally once you become keto adapted stay between one to three. And there's no presence of any kind of acidosis in the blood. So whenever somebody tries to bring up the keto acidosis thing, say, I don't eat high carb because that's the only way. And I'm not type one diabetic, which is most of the population. Only type one diabetics that eat a high carb diet and don't shoot up insulin will have any chance of having diabetic ketoacidosis. Everybody else, you're all right. We got it? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Number two, getting into ketosis totally zaps you of energy, the keto flu. Anybody suffered from the keto flu? I wish back in 2004 when I started this whole uh, Atkins journey uh, that somebody had told me about the ways to ward that off. So if you're just starting, I'm gonna tell you the ways to ward that off, so you're welcome. Um, keto flu is actually not the flu at all. It's just an electrolyte imbalance when you make that switch to being a sugar burn or from a sugar burner to being a fat burner. And so there are very specific elements in the body that you need to replenish that you tend to lose, especially in the early going. So definitely take notes if you're just starting on keto. Water, you're gonna lose a lot of water when you first start on a ketogenic diet. And you're like, well, what's that about? What it's about is when you switch from being a sugar burner, your body has to dump the sugar. Well, where is a lot of sugar stored in the body? It's in the glycogen stores of your muscles. Guess what else is in your muscles? Water. So if you have to pee a lot when you first start on a ketogenic diet, you're dumping that water. So you need to replenish that water. So you might feel a lot of thirsty, speaking of. So you drink a lot when you first start. Sea salt with bone broth. I know Dr. Westman talked about the bouillon cubes. If you wanna do it in a little more natural way without all those chemicals in the bouillon cubes, you can do sea salt with bone broth and it does just as an effective way of raising your salt levels because you're losing a lot of salt when you first start a ketogenic diet as well. So you need to replenish that. And again, somebody made the mention the other day when you're not eating processed foods, that's where you usually get your salt from. You've gotta add salt to the foods that you consume. And of course, potassium and magnesium are two very uh, critical uh, nutrients that you also wanna replenish in the body because you do lose those when you first start a ketogenic diet. Number three, a ketogenic diet increases the risk of heart disease. And we just, I just gave you a whole lecture on that, so I'll quickly go through this. It lowers trigs, raises, what happened there? Raises HDL. <laughs> Less small dense particles in the LDL, reduces HSCRP, that's that inflammation we talked about, drops blood sugar and insulin, and lowers your blood pressure. All of those things happen like a champ. So are they really not that heart healthy to, you know, you wanna be on a ketogenic diet. That looks like a pretty heart healthy way to eat. Number four. Simply eating low carb will put you in ketosis. How many believed that if you just ate low carb, that's ketogenic, raise your hand. Don't feel bad, I thought that. Just eat low carb, and, and for a lot of people, just low carb is probably good enough to get them in a state of ketosis, but some of us have to work a little harder at it that are very insulin resistant. So in Keto Clarity, and you can take a picture of this if you'd like, in Keto Clarity, oh, that was funny, everybody went <laughs> Keto Clarity, we, get, we did this acronym for keto, K is keep carbs low, E, eat more fat, T, test ketones often, and O, overdoing protein is bad. And these are uh, steps, and you can like print this out and put it on your refrigerator to remind you that this is what it takes to get really into ketosis for most people. Everybody got it? 
Number five, neglecting the key role of moderating protein intake. And if there's one feedback we've gotten about keto clarity bigger than anything else in the whole book is I had no idea protein was this big of a deal, but it's a big deal. And not that protein is bad, but the excess protein can be very bad. All right, so this is the geekiest slide I'm putting up today, so uh, I hope you memorize all this. And uh, anybody know what that is besides the medical professionals and you low-carb experts? I don't want you to yell out what it is. Anybody know? I hear crickets. It is this big, long G word, gluconeogenesis, and don't let that scare you. It's actually a new way to begin making sugar in the body. Did you know you can make sugar in the body in more ways than just eating sugar and carbs? Yeah, you can. When you consume too much protein for your body's needs, that excess protein, you don't store protein in the body. The only way it can store the protein in the body is to convert it through the liver into something the body can store, and that's sugar. It occurs mainly in the liver, and anytime you eat protein in excess, it gets converted to that glucose. So even Grumpy Cat knows he needs carbs, but he knows he doesn't have to eat them to get them because of what we call GNG or gluconeogenesis. Number six, testing for the presence of ketones only in the urine. How many people have just done that? Raise your hand. I did it for many years, and I, I really have uh, Dr. Steve Finney and Dr. Jeff Folick to thank for writing The Art and Science of low Carbohydrate Performance. And it's interesting when I was hearing him tell that story about why he wrote that book. Oh, all these athletes were writing them, and they wanted more on performance. And I'm not an athlete. Don't pretend to be. But I read the book, and there was a part in there about measuring uh, for another kind of ketone. I went, what other kind of ketone is there than what you pee on a stick? So, so I started learning and started investigating more and more about the various kinds of ketones. And now you're going to learn about them. A little Ketones 101 for you. Oh, that was funny, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, y'all just cracked me up. So uh, the first one is called acetoacetate. That is the primary ketone body that's in the urine. And so that's the one they measure in the urine with those keto sticks. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is the blood ketone. This is the primary one measured in the blood. We'll talk about that here in a second. And then the last one is acetone, and that's the one that's in your breath. Somebody came up to me before and said, oh, man, my wife's complaining. I have stinky breath. I said it's called acetone. And acetone is the ketone body in the breath. So let's take a look at the urine ketones, because they're highly unreliable, and here's why. So you have urine ketones present when you first start on a Banting diet, a LCHF, low carb, whatever you're calling it. Then over that two to four week period, for most people, you start to become keto adapted, and you start getting those converted into blood ketones. Now, what's the meter called here, uh, Professor Noakes, uh, that they can measure for ketones? Is it freestyle optium? Yeah. Yeah, the freestyle optium. So how many people measure blood ketones? Awesome, few of you. So the freestyle optium uh, is the meter here, and you can measure for the presence of blood ketones, and it's the blood ketones that you really kind of want to know where you stand with ketosis, because something interesting happens to the urine ketones once you become keto-adapted for a lot of people. Look at the screen. They're gone. Are you no longer keto adapted simply because your urine ketone sticks don't show any measurement of ketones anymore? No, you've done something very right. The acetoacetate has become beta hydroxybutyrate and that's a good thing. So don't worry about the urine sticks if they go away, that's normal. Um, I've always had them. They've never gone away for me or my wife, Christine. Uh, they've always stayed. So, But for those of you who get frustrated when you see a measurement that's supposed to tell you how much ketosis you're in and it's not showing that you're in ketosis anymore, I can see how that would be discouraging. Number seven, limiting grains, fruits, and vegetables will deprive you of nutrients. Anybody heard that excuse before? Yeah. So let's take a look at grains. They contain phytic acid, which prevents the absorption of key nutrients like copper, magnesium, iron, zinc, and calcium. We've only been eating them 
for about the past 10,000 years of human existence, which we heard the other day, if you put all the human history into one day, that was, or uh, one, what was it, one year, I'm sorry, that was yesterday. That's it. So we haven't been eating them that, that long in our human history. Plus, it's very difficult to consume grains without a lot of heavy processing. And we saw the other day how they were having to crunch them with sand, and then it was greedy. And if you have to do that much processing, is it really food? Have you ever tried to eat grains? You would break your teeth. So are they really healthy? I think not. How about fruits and vegetables? Oh, surely they're healthy. Well, of course they are. But you want to choose the low starch and the low sugar ones. They're the best ones. And according to a 2006 American Diabetes Association survey, 35% of U.S. adults and 56% of U.S. children's vegetable consumption was in the form of potatoes, mostly fried. What could that be? Oh, yeah, French fries. Any nutrients in those? As for, vegetable, or as for fruit, bananas are the go-to. And yet they have 29 grams of carbohydrate in a day. That's how many carbs I eat total a day. That's it. 29 grams in one banana. And I see there's a guy on the internet that calls himself a uh, um, durian writer. And he has a website called 30 Bananas a Day. He's a raw vegan. And he claims to eat 30 bananas a day. I'm thinking if I ate three bananas a day, I would not be doing well. So what does ketogenic nutrition look like? No grains, no sugars, no starch, mostly whole foods like eggs, meat, nuts, high fat dairy, and non-starchy vegetables, plenty of fat soluble vitamins. You know, the vegans always talk about how they've got the healthiest diet. They're not absorbing any kind of fat soluble vitamins if they're not consuming fat. Now there is a great way to do veganism if you want to do it or, or vegetarianism. You got to add high fat so coconut based oils and that kind of thing can help them have a higher fat version but those low fat vegans they're depriving their body of some key fat soluble vitamins. And if you consume more than just the muscle meat organ meats are incredibly nutrient dense so uh, in America, organ meats are like, Ugh. so how is it here? Is organ meat pretty much uh, embraced pretty well? No. no, okay, so it's just as bad as in America. <laughs> so I attend a conference every year called the American, um, or excuse me, the, um, help me out here. Uh, anyway, I forgot. It's one of the paleo conferences I go to. So uh, Matt, La oh, it got cut off. Sorry about that. Matt Lalonde is the guy that put this up here and he had a list, he did this kind of study of all the different nutrient density of various foods. And at the very top, you'll see organ meats, oils, uh, herbs and spices, nuts and seeds, cacao, fish and seafood. But go all the way to the bottom. Processed fruit, grains. Now it says animal fats and oils, but that's referring to the feedlot kind that are in America that are fed the grains and really sick animals. Uh, refined and processed fats. So go back up. I mean, all of those are nutrient dense foods. Can you see the top half? What is that? It's a low carb, high fat diet. Ancestral Health Symposium, that's what it was called. Sorry. <laughs> I had a brain fart there for a second. So, number eight, eating low carb, high fat will lead to hypothyroidism. Anybody heard this one before? Yeah, I mean, we hear these excuses over and over again about why people should not go on a ketogenic diet, and yet, is there any truth to it? Here's the truth. None of the medical professionals I've ever interviewed about ketogenic diets that have used this in practice with patients see this as a common problem with the diet. Lower thyroid number does not necessarily mean there's a lower function, though. As Dr. Ron Rosedale noted uh, in the book, Keto clarity, it often means a better function. And it's very easy to undereat on keto. Anybody uh, witness that? Your hunger is so satisfied that you forget to eat. Well, when you don't eat a lot of calories, it's that hypocaloric state that can start messing with your thyroid. And who's to say, here's an interesting food for thought, who's to say that the normal levels of the lab values for thyroid are actually normal. How about they're higher and we're normal in the lower range when we go keto? 
I don't know. I'd love to see that study done. Y'all need to get on that, you low-carb researchers. The fact is the thyroid doesn't have to work as hard when you're in ketosis. And despite the lower numbers, ketogenic dieters are asymptomatic of any hypothyroidism. So you're supposed to have cold hands and losing hair and all this stuff. It doesn't happen. And you heard from Andreas the other day, uh, there's really no need to consume those safe starches since carbs really are not essential. And even people who consume a high carb diet can suffer from hypothyroidism. So if it's low carb that's doing it, why does that happen? Most of the hypothyroidism is autoimmune that can be made worse when you consume starch. There was a January 2014 BBC News story that found European hunter-gatherers just 7,000 years ago were unable to digest starch. And guess what? We have the same genetic makeup as those people 7,000 years ago. Number nine, your brain needs glucose to function well. You heard this one, right? You get those dietitians like this lady. You need to consume 130 grams of carbohydrates daily for minimal brain function. This is to ensure that your brain gets all the adequate glucose, blah, blah, blah. They say that thinking there's no other way to fuel the brain. But your brain loves running on ketones as a primary fuel. It really does. So let's look at what happens to your brain in ketosis. You have stabilized mood and a decreased sense of anxiety. You have mental sharpness. You have a feeling of happiness and a general sense of well-being. Anybody that's in ketosis, can you attest to these things? I want a hallelujah. Yeah. Number 10, and this is the funniest one of all, so get ready. A ketogenic diet cuts calories. That's how it works for weight loss. They say that like it's a bad thing. So riddle me this, Batman. We have some powerful appetite suppressant drugs. Some of the most powerful in the world that will make you not eat. But we have powerful appetite suppressant foods. And I'm going to like uh, glory on this pork belly for a second. Uh, why do we think that is a healthier way to do it? than that. Number 11, our ancestors didn't live in a constant state of ketosis, and that's true, but let's take a look at that. What did they eat? Our early ancestors had fish, they had meat, eggs, fruits and vegetables, and nuts and seeds, but what else did they have? Hmm. What else could they have? Oh yeah, of course, they had ketones, right? One of my experts in keto clarity, Dr. Bill Wilson said, humans used both glucose and ketone bodies for energy and during periods of food shortage or after a big animal kill, guess what sustained our early ancestors? And it's at this point I feel like I'm the Baptist preacher who's describing a squirrel, and the little boy in the back of the room says, it sounds like a squirrel, but I'm gonna go with Jesus? <laughs> no, the obvious answer is ketones. <laughs> so a few final thoughts from Dr. Bill Wilson. Our ancestors spent most of their time in a state of ketosis. And if our early ancestors hadn't developed a way to use ketones for energy, our species would have ended up on the Darwin shortlist eons ago. So you already heard about the Inuit Eskimos. They were the first ketogenic society. I'm hurrying because I'm getting the flashing light. Arctic environment, can you grow anything in an Arctic environment? Not really. So they had to eat very low carb, very high fat by default, and yet they were still energetic and full of stamina, and they were the first major people group to be fully keto adapted. See, even a southern United States guy can talk fast. And the last one is uh, 12, athletes cannot perform well in ketosis. You've heard pretty well uh, over the past couple of days why that's not true. Now these athletes say, oh, we carb loaded, then what? Sorry, I'll take that off screen. That will have nightmares for days for you, sorry. Uh, why fat and ketones fuel exercise better? I asked that question to one of my keto clarity experts, uh, Ben Greenfield. He's an elite ketogenic triathlete. 
and metabolic superiority of fat for fuel, mental enhancement of ketosis, and greater health and longevity from controlled blood sugars when you go keto. Ketones are the preferred fuel source for the muscles, heart, liver, and brain, and none of these vital organs do well on carbohydrates and become actually damaged when consumed in excess. And athletes can consume more carbs and protein than non-athletes, but even then, they have to find the right mix. And this is like, if you take home one message from my talk, take home this. Just because one method for getting into ketosis helps one person, that doesn't mean that's your method. You've got to tinker and test and figure out what the appropriate macronutrient uh, is for you with all that. Exercise itself actually does raise your ketones, so there's a little more incentive to go exercise. And then lower inflammation will enable you to have a quicker recovery time. And ketone bodies are now being referred to in uh, performance circles as a super fuel, and you're going to be seeing a lot of products come out on the market that will be ketone generating. Look for it. It's coming. It's already here, actually, in America. There's a few companies working on it, uh, but the, they're going to take that super fuel and run with it. So that's Keto Clarity, and thank you very much.